uh, part two uh, of our lesson, did Jesus say he was God? Did Jesus say that he was God? And we're going to look at the book of Luke concerning this question, did Jesus say he was God? And uh, Luke, the 22nd chapter, verse 67 through 70. Can somebody please read that? If you are the Christ, the Messiah, tell us. But he said to them, if I tell you, will you not believe, trust in, cleave to, and rely on what I say? All right, so those words in parentheses are trying to help you understand what it's actually saying in the Strong's translation. Okay, so it's help clarifying the verse. So the first one says Christ, and that word Christ means the Messiah, okay? And then uh, to believe, it says it means to trust, to cleave, and to re rely on what Jesus says, okay? And if I question you, will you not answer? But hereafter, from this time on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. And they all said, you are the son of God then. You are the son of God then. And he said to them, it is just as you say, I am. All right. And when you see that word I am, uh, it's in capital letters, which means he's pointing to the God of the Old Testament. In the book of Exodus, when Moses asks, who, who, do you, okay. who am I to say who you are when I go back to Pharaoh and tell him to let your people go? So he's expressing himself as, as the Old Testament I am, which is God. Okay, so when Jesus makes this expression, they clearly knows what he's saying. All right? And he calls himself the Messiah, which we went over on last week. Uh, as well as he uses the word in verse 69, son of man. Anybody remember what son of man meant? Uh, son of man. The whole lesson last week we dealt with the Son of Man. Son of Man always pointed to what? God and what else? I'm going to write that down. Hmm? Christ's humanity. So it always pointed to deity and humanity. Right? God and man. So, And Jesus self-titled himself Son of Man. So if he's calling himself Son of Man... And we looked at all those scriptures on last week. For all of you who are just tuning in with us, you can go to uh, either YouTube and catch last week. If it's not up there, we're going to make sure it's downloaded. But you will also catch it on Facebook on last week uh, when Jesus makes these claims. And he mentions the term Son of Man over and over again, all right, throughout uh, the New Testament Gospels. Okay, in each case... Son of Man was always described with deity and man. Okay, so it speaks to God and man. Whenever Jesus said, here I come and I'm sitting on the cloud, riding on the clouds, right? That he's given all authority, all rule, all power. He's given all these descriptions. God has given him glory, all right? We know God will never share his glory with another, right? Right. Okay, so he's showing that he's equal with God because he shared God's glory, all right? And so no human can make that claim, all right? But only somebody who would be God and man, which is the Son of God. So we see him use Son of Man in verse 69, and he says the Son of Man should be seated at the right hand of the power of God, right? Yeah. Which he's speaking to about himself then in verse 70. And they said, watch this, here's a question, are you the son of God? And he said to them, it is just as you say I am. All right, now when he say that, when, when, when the leaders ask him if he's the son of God, they're not thinking like you and I are sons of God, okay, through adoption. They know that, he, that has nothing to do with his terminology. They knew he was claiming to be equal in deity with God, and we'll see that in further scriptures. Okay, And so this is why Jesus said in 67, uh, once they asked him, tell us who you are. Are you the Messiah? Jesus said to them, if I told you, you wouldn't even trust them to even believe it. So watch this. Jesus already knew. 
that even when he told them that they were God, they ain't going to believe him. And then he ends up telling them that he's God in the end. Verse 7. And they said, are you the son of God? And he said, yep, it's just as you say, I am. And that is not, do not take that in the 21st English thinking in the context when we say I am. No, he uses another form, and we see it in the Greek, that expresses I am when it comes to deity as God, God of the Old Testament. If Jesus didn't claim to be God, then why did they kill him? All right? And so watch this. John 19, and we're going to read verse 19 through and, and 21. Could somebody read that, please? Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. All right? So, so, so here are the religious leaders as they are preparing to crucify Jesus on the cross, and we see Pilate comes up with the sign that he makes, and it says, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, and the priests, they reject that whole idea. All right? Remember, they're rejecting the truth. They know it's the truth. And Jesus called him out on it many a times, saying that you know it's the truth. Saying that you blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which means what? To blasphemy the Holy Spirit means what? To, to, to lie to, against it. To, dis to lie dis against it? Discounting. Discounting? I just learned that blasphemy means blame. Well, in this context, when he say you blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, he's saying you're Take rejected. Away it's, it's rejecting the Holy Spirit. Right. It's, it's you rejecting all the evidence, and the Holy Spirit has revealed it plainly to you. In other words, Jesus is saying, you don't have an excuse. The Holy Spirit has made it plain. And because he's deity, he can say that because he knows in their heart that they are. And he said, yeah, you reject the truth anyway. Therefore, to blaspheme the Holy Spirit means to reject the Holy Spirit, to reject the works of Christ. Remember, they even call his works that he was doing the works of who? The Satan. The, the devil. devil. Satan. Yeah. And Jesus was like, oh, that's good. If you're talking about blasphemy, now that's blasphemy. You call him the works of God, the works of the devil? All to try to deceive and mislead people and you the priest? You see, that's why you got to be careful what passes you sit up under. When you see shady, 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 you got to be careful when the Holy Spirit reveals to you what their works are. You got to be careful. Because there are leaders who will mislead you on purpose. Because their heart is not in it to lead souls to Christ. But they have a whole other objective. And for the Pharisees and the priests and Sadducees, lawmakers, it was prestige, power, money, respect, honor. And the list goes on and on. All right. So they say, do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be. You see how they, they rejected Jesus' whole claim, regardless of the evidence. He claims to be the chief king of the Jews. So we see the, the reason that they're killing him, all of a sudden, we see in the text, is pointing to the fact that he claims to be king of the Jews. All right? Mark 15, 31 through 32. Somebody read that. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the Lord mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Christ, the king of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe those who crucified with him also hit his us of him. Alright, so we know that this is happening while Jesus is where? On the, cross. On, the cross. On the cross. And while this happened, they mock him and they say, wait, he, saved, he claims he saved everybody else, 
Well, tell him to save himself. After all, he claims to be the redeemer of Israel, the one who comes to bring salvation. Well, why can't he save himself? They don't understand the point of the cross at all. And Jesus hid it from them on purpose. Remember, we went over that last week. He hid, he hid the totality of what he was doing, and he scattered it through the scriptures, through the prophets, and he even gave them scattered teaching about it in order not to allow the devil to know the point of the cross. Because the scripture says if they had knew that they was crucifying the Lord of glory, what would have happened? They wouldn't have did it. The Roman soldiers, if all the people truly knew what they were doing, if the enemy, Satan, knew, he would have never pushed them in that direction. So he scattered the truth. Remember? Jesus was revealing his purpose, and as he came to his last three years, he began to make it more clear who he was, especially when he was on his way to the cross. He began to clearly reveal, and they still couldn't get it because it was scattered. It was like a mystery. It was like a puzzle or a bunch of pieces to a puzzle that's scattered all over the floor, and you're trying to put the pieces together, but you don't have the top of the box. And so you get some pieces right, other pieces you can't figure out if you only had the top. So Jesus said, I scattered it on purpose so the enemy could not thwart his plans. Amen? And so they say right here, verse 32, this king of Israel, right, make him, they're making a mockery of him. Okay, because he claims to be king. To be king of Israel means he's what? Claim to be um, God. Claims, claims to be deity. Claims to be right. God claims to be the one who's supposed to come back and judge. Claims to be the Messiah. Claims to be the one who's supposed to overthrow. In their mind, they thought he was supposed to overthrow Rome. Set up his kingdom. They were looking for a warrior. A warrior. They were looking for somebody more like Muhammad. Right? He's about the leader. And they was looking for fighting some type of war or somebody who was going. And that's kind of how Muhammad won many of his converts off. It was through the sword. So he didn't come in the way that they thought he would. But yet while he's revealing and unfolding his plan, it threw many of them off. And because they hardened their hearts, they could not receive the master's plan. Even the disciples fell off during the course. So even their faith got shaken, right? And so they tell Jesus, if you are who you say you are, come down from the cross so that we might believe. Save yourself. Do something miraculous. Right. And what they didn't understand is that he had to stay on that cross. Their lives depended on it. Our lives depended on it all the way in 2020. It depended on Jesus being crucified on that cross. Blood had to be shed. Okay? The blood had to, had to pierce from his side. The crown of thorns had to be placed on his head. Blood had to come streaming down. His flesh had to be torn. He had to be mocked. It was all part of the process. He was bruised. He became smitten. And, and God poured out his wrath on him. He died in our place. He took on sin. Say that again. In, in one case, he became like a woman born when they stripped him of his flesh as they flogged him with leather whips with strips and bones and metal that was in it and glass as they flogged him. And so this was part of the process. The lamb that was to be sacrificed before the foundation of the world, or slain. And so he was truly slain. The blood fell as if it were the lambs that were crucified, or, or that were sacrificed on the mercy seat so that forgiveness of sins might be made for the people so that God would be appeased and not pour his wrath on men. He became 
the sacrifice once and for all for us. All right. And then uh, let's look at the word blasphemy, okay? That's what I wanted to get to because they, they kept saying everything that Jesus was doing is blasphemy. And, and this is a clear definition of that word blasphemy. It means the act of cursing, slandering, reviling, or showing contempt or lack of reverence for God's attributes, words, and works. Okay, just to go a little bit further into it in a biblical context, blasphemy is the attitude of disrespect that finds expression in an act of directed against the character of God, an insult to the honor of God, words or actions that express contempt for God and what he has set apart as holy. All right? And that's just a big picture all the way around. All right? And so we're going to look at what the scripture says as they claim blasphemy about Jesus. Going into John 10th chapter, verse 31 to 33. And, and, and this is going into the reasons why they killed him. This is still on track with the reasons why they killed him. Somebody read it. Did you hear that? So it's evident Jesus made the claim that he was God. They knew it based on everything he kept saying. And when they asked some questions, and he said, even if I tell you the truth, you don't even want to hear it. You won't even recognize it. And then he makes the claim once they say, are you the son of God? He said, yes, I am. All right? And so here it is. They're making a claim. They want to stone him. And Jesus says, I mean, he really called their ignorance out. For which miracle do you want to stone me for? In other words, for which act of God do you want to stone me for? Do you hear what he's saying to them? I mean, he called and they called on them out to the carpet. So y'all want to stone me. Okay. For which one of the works of God do you want me going for? You want to kill me for the works of God, you priests? You lawmakers. And watch this. We're not stoning you for any of these, but because of, what's that word again? Blasphemy. Blasphemy. They said you're not who you claim to be, and they say you claim to be God, not a mere man. So by their testimony, it's evident Jesus claims to be God. And they understood that. Remember, he's speaking over... Or, or at least 2,000 years ago, he's speaking to the audience that he's dealing with in their context based on their circumstance and situation. So he knows how to reach his audience. And that's why for many of us, it doesn't always come off as if Jesus is plainly saying it. It almost sounds like we're going in circles because he's not speaking to 21st century. You and I, he's speaking to, you know, those who were in his day and in his time period, around right about 31, 30, 32, 33 AD at this point. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Uh, about 32, about, the, about, about that time period. And When they speak to him, uh, they're outraged by his comments. Look at John 19 and 7. Somebody read that one, please. All right, to be the son of God is making himself equal with God. We'll see that in 518. Somebody go there. That's, that's still in John. 518. Somebody read it, please. Because of this, the Jews tried all the harder to kill him. 
Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. All right, so you see the Son of God points to the idea of more than just what we think of as sonship. Way more. Because first he says he's breaking the Sabbath, which he wasn't, okay? But in their mind, he's breaking the Sabbath because they made up all these religious uh, rules for the Sabbath to keep people from even helping each other on the Sabbath. But yet they take care of their own animals on the Sabbath, and he's like, wait a minute, you you looking out for them, but you tripping because I'm healing somebody on the Sabbath? <laughs> right, right. And so they say that he's breaking the Sabbath, and then calling God his own father. Why? Because to call God his own father in Jesus' context that he's using is to make himself equal with God. They totally got it. And this is why he was being crucified. Now, why is Jesus called the son of God? All right. We're going to look at four different reasons. And these are important because most of us know the term and we've said the term Son of God and we've heard it over and over and over. But do we truly know what the Son of God entails? What does that mean? I mean, it, it, it oftentimes sounds so common. You want to say something? Now, would you go back to the, to the uh, yeah, why, why, did, why is Jesus called the Son of God? Okay. So, so here's how we're going to make it clear. You need these notes because this is going to help you when you have to deal with somebody. That last verse is going to help you too because to call himself son of God is to make himself equal with God. So he's not talking normal sonship as human sonship. But he's talking about divine sonship. Okay? So watch this. Number one, by being sinless, holy as unique son of God. You can find that in Luke, the first chapter, uh, verse 35. And this is why Jesus is called Son of God, okay? Because he was sinless, he was holy as a unique Son of God. And when we say unique, what do you think that means? Think of his uniqueness. Because he the way he was. Different how? He was, not, he, he was not born like because of birth. birth. Birth, what else? Altogether. Well, was he not like men? Well, his deity shown through. He was Okay. Man. So was he man? Well, he was man and God at the same time. Okay. But, well, yeah, being sinless, mm -hmm. holy, set apart. Right? He's holy, right? He's set apart in a, in a unique way, right? For God's use, he's set apart as taking on the image of God. We're going to see that. I mean, I mean, it, it, it can really be a big word in the sense of unique, all right? He is the, a divine being unique, son. Divine being, okay? He's not a created God, as some would say. But he always existed, just like the Father always existed. And just like the Holy Spirit always existed. And we're going to look at that briefly. All right, number two. The number two reason why Jesus is called the Son of God is because he's commissioned by God, he's sent by God into the world. And you can look at that in the book of John, and, and I got the verses up there, okay? And uh, this is a pretty unique thing that, that this really brings us into as far as him being commissioned by God and sent by God into the world. And why was he sent in, into the world? This is what makes him unique. But, uh, He's commissioned by God. He has a mission by, by God, right? God gives him a mission. To take on the sins of the world. Right? Right? And it's to take on the sins of the world. And what else? Is that it? So that we might be saved. So that we might be saved, right? Yeah. Right? Sins, to sins need to be dealt with record, to reconcile us back to God. Right. right? This is all part of his commission. Right? So come on. There's nothing human about that. Okay? 
Huh? Destroy the works of the devil. That's big time. Anybody know what that word destroy the works? What does it mean to destroy the works of the devil? Because watch it. If the works of the devil is destroyed, then why is he still causing hell? So what does that mean to destroy the works of the devil? The final result is hell for him. Okay, but are those the works of the devil, though? Does the devil make hell? Well, oh, no. Does the devil create death? So those aren't the works of the devil. Though all, death came because of what? Sin. Sin. Right? Even though the devil persuaded man to, to go into a sinful direction, the works of the devil would be more like what? Sin, right? Sin, all sin, right? All the temptations of it. Uh, and then it's the fact that we're born in the sin now, right? Because of Adam and Eve's choice, right? We're born in the sin, right? And so the works of the devil is all that is evil, right? That is prompted by the spirit of Satan and his demons. And to destroy those works, that word destroy actually means in the Greek to unravel. It means to loosen. Uh, like the donkey that was tied up the colt, Jesus said, I'm going to send you to go get a donkey, and if the owner asks you, who asks you for this donkey? And he said, tell him, I asked you. All right? And, and, and it, it was the idea of the colt being unloosed from its, from maybe the rope that was around him that kept him from restricted. All right? So it's a picture of sin that restricts us. And then God coming and loosen us through his word. He, he sets us free through his word. He sends his son as a messenger. Like the one lady, yes. the, the one lady who was uh, bent over, mm -hmm. healed her, and he mm -hmm. said, I'm loosening her from, from Satan. Right, right. Right? Loosen them from it is it's it's causing sin's grip or the power of Satan's grip to be weakened. So that you can be free. It also points to Lazarus when he was wrapped in the tomb. And once he called Lazarus forth, he told them to what? Loose him. Right? And he unraveled because he was bound. It's a picture of sin that bounds us, that binds us, and it's being loosed, unraveled. And like yes. the opposite, we say, no one can put you out of my father's hands. Okay. But God got it, ain't nobody going to unloose that wood. Right. Like with Satan, he like, you know what I'm saying? He weakens his power. Right? And that's why we're here today, because his power has been weakened. Do y'all remember when you couldn't get to church, even though you had the strength to get that? Do you remember when you couldn't get to church because flesh said, I ain't going? Flesh didn't want nothing to do with church, nothing to do with God. Do you remember when you was restricted to serve God? You couldn't do the things that you are doing now because of sin. But when he sets you free, you're no longer bound. Three, by resurrection, right? He's the son of God by resurrection but in the evidence because of the resurrection. He is the firstborn of those who have been resurrected. And you'll see that in Acts, the 13th chapter, verse 32 and 33. You can read that on your own time. Right? So he's commissioned by God, resurrected by God. It's the evidence that he is the son of God. Number four, created the universe. Right? He is the hair of all, the heir of all. He is the image of God. Man, that's unique, isn't it? So to be the son of God entails all these different dynamics. And that's right there in Hebrews, the first chapter, verse 2, and you see that in verse 5. You know, it, 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 he intent, he's the creator of all things. So, so this is what makes him the unique son of God. Is that unique or not? Anything human about that? So Jesus' claim must be true. So let's look at the Trinity. 
Let's look at that word Trinity. Okay, because some would say, well, how is Jesus divine? How is he God also? Don't we serve one God? Or do we serve a multiple, multiple gods? <clears throat> you Christians always use the word Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you Christians claim that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. They are God. Unique in the Godhead. Let's look at what the word Trinity means. All right? It is the union of three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in one Godhead so that all three are one God as to substance but three persons as to individuality. Alright? So this is Webster's description of it and it's a valid description when it comes to the Trinity. It is all three making up the one Godhead. When the Lord in the Old Testament when it says the Lord our God is one, in the beginning God created the heaven and earth that word God actually is plural alright, and so it means more than one more than one God is always split, in the Old Testament revealed it, we don't have time to go through that that's not part of the day, but the Old Testament reveals the Son the Spirit and the Father all through it, and the New Testament makes it plain what that was all about. Okay, the word Trinity is not found in the Bible. It is a terminology that was uh, that, that, that came together that expresses the triunity of God. Okay? Okay, even if we never use the word Trinity, we know God is one, and he's one in three persons. And he's revealed all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we'll deal with that when we go through the study of the Godhead. So this is why Jesus is equal with God. All right? Same substance. Right? And so because of that, he's really changing their theology of who God is. You remember when John sent the message back to his disciples and said, go tell Jesus or ask Jesus, is he the one or should I look for another? Is he the one, or should I look for the word, or another? That word another in the Greek means the same substance. It means one similar to. Okay? So, so he, he sees and recognizes Jesus to be the Messiah, but what he's asking is something that the Jews believed in the Old Testament was there was multiple messiahs is what they thought. And so he wanted to know, are you the one? Are you the one that's supposed to set the captives free? Are you the one? One of the same kind? Same substance? All right. So, as we close out, does Jesus claim in Scripture sound like he is only a man? What do you think? One person said no. Does the scriptures that we just read have been going over, does it sound like, do I have everybody to All right. Does it sound like that Jesus is only a man? Can you whisper any softer? Let's look at, this, let's look at what Jesus' claims are as we've been going through here. All right? Number one, before Abraham was born, I am. Speaks of deity, speaks of God. Your sins are forgiven. And we know to forgive sins, you have to be God. No man can forgive sins. Not a priest, not a pastor, nobody can. Number three, I and the Father are one. Right? He's saying well, I'm equal to God. All authority under heaven and earth is given unto me. These are the claims that Jesus made. Whoever obeys my word will never see death. Hi. Wow, whoever obeyed my words? Well, I thought we were supposed to obey the scriptures. Right. Well, Jesus is saying in the beginning, he, 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 John gets it. In the beginning was the word, and the word was, and the word was, amen. Right? 
So Jesus says, whoever believes in my words, that is a claim to be God. Right. Right. right? He will never see death. No man can make that claim. Six, I am the resurrection and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Oh, what? What man makes a claim like that? Seven, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows after me would never walk in darkness. Not a mere human claim. Can any one of you prove me guilty of sin? Jesus asked that question to the leaders, to the religious leaders. Now, what man, that would be blasphemy for a man, a mere man, to say, who can prove me guilty of sin? All of us can find out somebody who can prove us guilty of sin. Am I right about it? Number nine, Father, glorify me with the glory I had before the world began. Whoa, wait a minute. That's definitely not a mere man's claim. It's evident Jesus is making a claim to be God. In Mark's earliest gospel and critical scholarship, here's what Mark says, and we close. Mark says this. this is all, you'll find all these in the book of Mark. He is the Messiah and the Son of Man. John prepares the way of the Lord. The Father calls Jesus his beloved Son. The winds and the waves obey his voice. Demons are cast out. He heals diseases, forgives sins. He's the Lord of the harvest and the Sabbath. Uh, I thought God instituted the Sabbath. To be the Lord of the Sabbath, you must be God. And he has power over nature. I conclude again by saying, does this sound like someone who is only a man? Of course, that's what they say about it. That's what who says about it. All of them heard that too. Correct. It's evidence through historical writing. It's the evidence that the scriptures lay. Okay, the evidence for Muhammad, Muhammad said that he never performed any miracles. He would only claim to be a prophet. So he's not even in the same category. He claims to be a mere man. So, so what we see here are not just the Messiah's claims, but it is the evidence of God. God makes the claim. It is the evidence of the prophets of the Old Testament. It is the evidence of the scriptures. It is the evidence of Jesus' works. He's got evidence that goes on and on and on. John the Baptist gives it the evidence. It is evidential through all, all throughout scripture. And if we were to look at atheist scholars and what they wrote, as well as those who wrote in biblical history and time period, even they said the disciples made these claims. That this is not something that our religion was changed over the course of time. And Jesus mythologically became all these things. Marx is the earliest writings. Marx's writings are around about seven years or less before Jesus' death. The earlier the writers make their claims, then the more reliable the claim is. Because watch this. If, okay, how long ago was it when Obama was in office? 2008. No, oh, before then, because he was uh, uh, before he was. When did he start? When did he come in office? Oh, wait, wait, what office? Because he was president. Two thousand eight. All right. So Obama comes in office at that time period. What year is it now? Twenty. Twenty twenty. Now, if we were to make up fictitious claims about Obama, claiming to be the son of God claiming that he died and rose from the grave, 
claiming that he performed all these miracles and all these different things that he made, and he had disciples who went around saying the same thing, those claims could easily be debunked if they were myths. You would have plenty of writings. You would have you would have CNN, CNN uh, Fox. You will have every station, YouTube, everybody be writing reports on how these claims are untrue because they were alive during Obama's reign as president. And so would it be for Jesus Christ. If his claims were to be false, we would have other writers, other evidence, other reporters, other historians making historical claims that this never was true. And we don't have those writings. The claims say, and we'll go over that in the coming weeks, what I'll come up, I have 12 historical claims from people going back in biblical time periods who wrote historical books that scholars agree with across the board are legitimate claims from those who are even enemies of Christ who say, this is what the disciples said they saw, this is what the disciples believe, and therefore it makes their claims evidential because it has not been corroborated over time. And that helps to prove our case. Amen? All right. Well, we thank you all for watching with us and tuning in to uh, part two of is, Did Jesus Claim to Be God? And so we went over many different scriptures to come up with the evidence of what Jesus said. And based on our historical findings, it's comes up to be clearly accurate that Jesus does make that claim to be equal with God, to be the son of God, to be the son of man, and his claims to be deity. And so with that being said, and the understanding of the Trinity, which we'll go over at another time, it becomes clear to us that Jesus claims to be God. And so we put our rest and our trust in the scriptures and the biblical evidence that has been put forth. So we thank you for tuning in. Once again, we have Bible study every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. at God's Way Gospel Church. I'm the pastor, Eric L. Cunningham, and our location is 15501 Euclid Avenue. We thank you for tuning in, and we hope to see you here soon. You can also uh, come to our worship service this on Sunday at 10.30 a.m., and uh, we just look forward to seeing you. God bless you.